And we are live. Greetings and salutations, beautiful beams. And thank you so much for joining us today on this very, very special Saturday stream. Because look, I brought friends. I have here today Andy Hook and Giles Gasper, who together form the team, or I should say head up the team behind Eat Medieval. I know there are some other beans in there. You know, we always say it's not a World Anvil stream without some audio issues. Let's try that again. Greetings and salutations at Beautiful Beans. We have a very special stream today because I have lovely friends. Let's see if we can hear them. Andy, are you there? I am. Hello, everyone. Oh, no, they can't hear you yet. Let me fix that particular conundrum. I'm terribly sorry about this. Usually everything goes so smoothly, but today, no, apparently not. Let's try that again. Andy, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, I believe that we can. And Giles, are you there? I am. Hi. Through the magic of Zoom. There we go. I am sorry about those technical issues, guys. Um, it's a new setup and uh, yeah, big old box in the machine, I'm afraid. So today we are talking, of course, about medieval food. You kept asking me for a medieval food episode of the podcast live and look who I brought. I brought the head honchos from Eat Medieval, which is a freaking awesome, awesome thing. Giles, tell us a little bit more about Eat Medieval. Uh, Eat Medieval was a, a combination really of uh, university research, uh, which I head up uh, Durham, uh, me and colleagues there. Uh, and some a little bit further afield. And then the restaurant, uh, which is Blackfriars Restaurant in Newcastle, which you can see behind Andy there. Um, so what we've done over the last 10 years or so is work together on uh, interpreting medieval recipes in discovering a few, um, but mostly kind of working with the culinary chefs because I can translate them, I can read them, I can think about, you know, the... Uh, historical cultural context but actually going to the chefs and saying how would you do this how do these flavors work together sometimes many of the recipes are really just a list of ingredients incredibly elliptical sometimes there's a bit more as you get later in the tradition there's more instruction but actually when there isn't much and even when there is you actually want to go and talk to Andy and his uh, the head chef Chris and cookery chef Craig to say, well, how would you do this? These were created for master chefs in the in the past, and working with master chefs in the in the present is a, a way of bringing it to life in a, in a slightly different way. So we're we're bringing medieval food to life, but for a modern palate as well. Amazing. So you translate them, Giles, from whichever their original language was into modern English, and then Andy translates them from the page into the glory of sensuous, beautiful food. Tell us just a little bit about that, Andy. Um, so 20 years ago, I took over Blackfriars, which is a former 13th century Dominican friary. So very exciting. Um, the one of the probably fifth oldest buildings in Newcastle. Um, not, not quite the oldest. There are even older buildings in Newcastle, which is amazing. Um, and uh, we had this banquet hall and, we, and I wanted to put on banquets, but didn't know much about it. So I'm not a, uh, I'm not a, a historian academ academically, but I have a have gained a huge interest. So 10 years ago, I asked Durham University, is there anyone that could help me um, produce a kind of authentic version of a medieval banquet? And um, Charles popped up and said, yeah, I'll help you. Mm -hmm. And so he's helped me to understand that. And, and my job really is to make it exciting for the audience. So to take the, take the knowledge and the information and the recipes and say, well, how can we translate that into something that is really exciting? And something that people are going to want to enjoy. That is wonderful. Now that you've heard them, now that you've heard what they do, let me introduce them just a little bit further. Giles Gasper is a professor of high medieval history at Durham University and specializes in European history of the 11th to 14th centuries, which is of course when all the best cookbooks were written. Um, it's culture, ideas, especially science and religion. We're going to be digging more into that in a minute. And the people and the food. 
and multi-talented restaurateur Andy Hook, who has a bit of a musical background as well as a physics background, has created not one but four restaurants in the north of England. And together, of course, they head up the team of Eat Medieval. We'll be revealing even more about that, but I happen to note that they are running a course in March and there is a seat being raffled off as we speak, or will be very shortly. Tell us just a, a snippet about that course. What can people expect? Uh, Barry, whoops! Good God, the ticket. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we've, um, as Giles said, we kind of uh, have been. Uh, we've been collaborating for ten years uh, or so, and primarily running in-house um, workshops, courses, cookery courses, lectures, and so on. Really, to get a better understanding of how um, medieval food and, and, and all the bits that surround it worked. Um, and Eat Medieval was going to be a in-house um, summer school uh, last September, and of course COVID put paid to that, and so we thought let's um, let's let's launch it um, online uh, as a virtual course. And actually, that's been great because we've been able to work with people from around the world, which has been really exciting, and our audience has grown and has been far larger than it ever would have been had we just had the summer school. Um, and we've tried to work out, try to figure out how we break the courses down. So the first one was uh, Taste of the Past, which was really uh, working with some very old recipes that I'll let Giles talk about later. Uh, the second one was about Christmas um, and um, the festivities of Christmas. And then, of course, that led naturally onto Easter. Easter being the biggest Christian medieval festival uh, going and lots of um, lots of traditions, lots of things to try and understand uh, food-wise and beyond. And that's Absolutely. what we're doing uh, at the end of March. Wonderful. Okay, so guys, if you want to check that out, eatmedieval.com is where you can find all of that information. I've seen that the March stuff is already up, so you can have a look at that. And uh, of course, in the English tradition, uh, Christmas may be more important, but everybody in Greece and the Orthodox uh, tradition knows that Easter is where all the best food happens. That's where you get a whole roast lamb. That's where you get everything with eggplant. It's glorious. So uh, yeah, this is, this is not one to miss, guys. All right, let's jump straight into our questions. And I want to start with a big one, a big open question for you guys, just to kick us off. What do you think is the most misunderstood thing or the most sort of the biggest misconceptions, essentially, about medieval cuisine within the modern mind? So like in our zeitgeist now, uh, what are things that you see maybe in medieval fantasy settings that people are just are just repeatedly getting wrong or misrepresenting? Yeah. Um, so actually in the courses, we, we do a... Uh, thing called myth we have a little myth busting corner um there's lots actually and um, some of the more obvious ones uh they drink water everybody drinks water it's not the 19th century it's not cholera um you would be a bit silly to drink it downstream of somebody that had just uh, crossed with their horses or if you're in a city you don't want to be downstream of the tannins but but water is fresh and that's fine and even if they are drinking ale, uh, this sort of image of everybody being half cup, um, you know, when you make medieval ale, because um, it doesn't have hops uh, until the 14th century, um, you tend to use the same grain to take three runnings. So what comes out of the, the third running, the small ale, is really barely 1%. Uh, it might even only be about half. So. So that notion too. And then spiced meat. They spice things because they like the flavour of spices, not because they have disgusting meat that they've kept for too long. Um, so this is a society with more access to fresh food than we do. So, um, so spicing, okay. spicing is the palate that they, that they like. So that, I think those will be the three that I have agree. Absolutely. Anything to add to um, that, Andy? Well, I was going to say another um, common misconception, I guess, is how people um, went about a banquet or a um, or a feast, and uh, Hollywood would lead us to believe that um, it was a a pretty raucous uh, affair with people uh, chewing uh, chicken drumsticks or turkey drumsticks and throwing them <laughs> over their shoulder with great abandon. And so medieval well, times, New York. You're telling yeah, us this, yeah. this isn't authentic. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Shockingly, the may, well, hey, the may the may have been a bit of that, but there was a 
there was a real respect for dining and it was a civilized affair and you you see a lot of a lot of things that you see in in certain modern cuisine um these days the idea that you wash your hands um on your way in uh to the hall that um when you sit down you sit in a mess of maybe two or four uh people and you serve the person opposite you um that um when when you eat you eat um in a um not in a delicate manner but in a civilized uh a very civilized manner um and uh, there's great respect for the um tr uh, the dining traditions and um people are taught that from a young age and uh, the etiquette the, you know, the etiquette um is there's more information that we found about etiquette than there were about recipes uh, from the early period and that's um, and that's because uh, it's not to say it's not a fun and enjoyable but it's um yeah, there's a lot of thought put into it yeah absolutely um i want to just add here forks Folks, they didn't yes. eat with forks. Forks are new. Nobody had forks. You had a knife, the bust. And again, you will tell us more about this. You will give us the official TLDR on this one. But uh, yeah, forks are a no in the medieval period, as far as I can, I have understood at least. Yeah. Um, so you you talked a little bit about about medieval banquets, which is great because that's where I wanted to go next. That's of course this the the typical picture when you think of medieval food. You think of these sort of massive fancies and castles made of pastry and swans made of sugar. What is, what do we know about medieval banquets? So for example, for a high day or a holiday, can you paint me a sensory picture of what that might've been like with all the trimmings? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, we have more evidence for um, elite dining. So this is, this is what it is. We have quite a lot of evidence of what peasants were eating. Um, we just don't know particularly how it's being prepared. Um, it's a big, big shift in peasant diet in England, at least uh, around the 13th into 14th centuries. Um, but a big feast, yeah, it would have been um, probably around midday. You don't want to do it too much at night. Um, this is a custom that comes in in the 12th century, uh, actually in uh, mimicking the Byzantine emperors, that the main meal is lunchtime. Okay, um, Or at that midday. Um, yeah. And so it's then served in courses, uh, they come out, but uh, medieval food at that level, if this is a visit of a king or a you know, particularly prestigious um, bishop or in Episcopal households of the same secular, um, you'd have a number of different courses that come out, you'd have entertainments between them, and that's the origins then of these wonderful uh, creations, uh, so you'd have musical entertainment, but also these um, fantastic uh, and fantastical um, dishes that are put together, uh, not all of them edible, um, but the kind of food pretending to be another food, um, so uh, you have the, well, the hen of the eggs cockatrice is quite um, famous, but um, but in Lent you get quite a lot of dishes. Uh, we will show you a couple if you come on the course, uh, where you you can't eat meat. So you have um, fish, but you put it in a mould to make it look like chicken or eggs. You can do amazing things with eggs. And then, as you say, these wonderful architectural features. So we, we actually had a go with our Christmas course um, at a castle, uh, sort of, would keep and then four towers which are amazing um, dishes uh, just sweet sweet dishes the, the main keep which the instruction was should be uh, a foot tall we actually could only make it six inches was it just a massive pork pie um, <laughs> um, okay no. that sounds like the fort i want to conquer i like that what were the technical challenges as a modern chef approaching this stuff like like, well, where were the, where were the moments where you go? How the hell did they do this without modern cooking? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, there was. I mean, the the, the challenges um, primarily is how we interpret. Um, so you know, we we have looked at. Um, so I, I alluded to these early recipes that Charles um, uh, will, will no doubt uh, uh, talk about, which originate from the twelfth uh, uh, century and. Um, and they are one-liners. It's yeah. to you know take the juice of customary, slake it with vinegar and add some pepper or something like that. And it's like, what does that mean? What does that you know? Where do you go with a recipe like that? Um, as John said, mo many of the recipes are elliptical, um, and they 
they, the, the, the language is really quite difficult to understand. So if you do a, a, a literal translation of some of the recipes, then we, we look at that and then what, what on earth do they mean by that? Um, and then you kind of get an idea. And then the idea for us is how do we develop that into a recipe that's good for the restaurant, but still has its origins in the medieval past? And um, that's, that's where the challenge is because someone eating that might say, well, you just made a regular dish here. You know, where, where's, and, and with all these things, it's well, okay, yeah, you might have to explain it. You might have to um, animate it a little bit. Sure. Provide um, context. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, that, yeah, that's right. I mean, they, they were using similar kind of um, ingredients to us, albeit kind of a wider variety of stuff which I found really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to talk more about seasonal ingredients as well, but um, we've talked about the, the highest of the high, the upper echelons of society. I'd love to hear about on the other side. Now you said you, we don't know so much about how peasants, yeah. like how peasants were cooking, but can you tell us a little bit about sort of the range of ingredients they might've been eating and yeah. also the other sensory factors they might've been experiencing as they were eating? What, what, what would that meal experience be like? Yeah, um, uh, to Ted Russell first, I mean, actually starting back back with the elite. Um, I mean, the other thing to remember is colour, that this is an incredibly colourful period. They, they really enjoy doing that. This would have been a carnival, actually, a big, a big feast. Uh, we looked at recipes for Christmas for Boar's Head. Actually, they, there's only one that we found that was contemporary to the Middle Ages. This is from Taillon, um, a French chef. Uh, but that's not just taking the bull's head, it's making sure that you've dyed it in a particular way. So this would have been quite vibrant as it came in. Wow. Um, that's obviously for big occasions. So I think even in noble households, if it's just, you know, a normal day, um, it would be fairly uh, toned down. Um, with, with, with peasants, it, uh, certainly in the 12th and 13th centuries, uh, this is a largely legume-based diet, uh, largely vegetarian, some meat as it, as it comes around. Um, as that moves into the 14th and then 15th centuries, it does seem to me to be that they're moving to a, the sort of aping the gentry who are aping the nobility, who are aping the kings. So there is more, uh, more meat that's being eaten. Um, and it just sort of depends quite, you know, what level you're talking about. Peasant households can be quite wealthy, especially by the, by the later middle ages. Uh, yeah, interesting. So, and then how about the, the lowest the other, of the low? Oh, sorry. sorry, sorry. Go. Well, I was gonna, yeah, well, actually, yeah, I was going to, I was going to mention, uh, mention that, that, um, of course, the big difference is that um, in the absence of potatoes, um, then bread was the main carbohydrate. And um, so bread, bread was absolutely fundamental to the diet and went kind of a little bit hand in hand with ale because they're made in a very uh, similar way, um, uh, of course. And, and uh, the quality of the bread was um, dependent on one, the quality of the flour that you could get and the other was your class. And so the, um, the higher up you were, the whiter you wanted your bread to be, even though now we know that that's probably gonna be less healthy uh, mm -hmm. for them. But the first kind of big laws, laws of size and so on that came in were all about bread. And there's, um, uh, there's so so many so much history about um, uh, a bread. You know, when people talk about the upper crust, uh, for example, that's the kind of reference to the fact that bread was cooked in a in a wood wood oven, and uh, the the, uh, the the base of it would get a little bit um, wood ashy. And so, if you had if you had a bit more money, you would always ask for the upper crust, and so on. So there's there's, there's lots of things uh, to do with um, uh, bread. But yes, the peasants would have eaten uh, bread and and. Um, if they couldn't get their hands on any regular kind of proper flour, they'd really, they'd really um, uh, grind up um, anything that they could find, roots and corns and um, uh, nuts and so on, to try and make a form of bread. Interesting, interesting. So we're really looking at bread as absolutely the staple here, which you know will be will be familiar to a lot of people still as as uh, you know the base part of the diet. Um, I'm going to tell you something terrible now. Uh, I hope you're ready. Uh, I don't know how familiar you are with Game of Thrones, but whenever I go to Holland, we call it the Lannister diet because everything is in bread. <laughs> um, literally everything. It's extraordinary. Every, yeah. You know, it, it's just it's just much more a part of a part of sort of daily 
daily repast. Um, okay, so we've, we've talked about the sensory picture of food, we've talked about the um, conspicuous consumption in food, and of course, the richest and the poorest. Let's talk about rituals, because I think that that is one of the most interesting aspects of food. Obviously, you know, I love to eat, I love recipes, and I love to cook. But I think things like rituals and traditions that surround food are fascinating to me. What can you share of sort of unusual things from the medieval period? Um, yeah, I mean, they, uh, I mean, it's quite a finickety cuisine, as, as Andy was saying. So it's, it's again, yeah, the, the bone plinging feast of, um, of Imad, uh, yeah, as you said, medieval times. I went to the one in Toronto once. <laughs> oh, actually, I was got taken there. Um, <laughs> Forcibly. <laughs> Under duress. <laughs> so, so the kind of very specific rituals about how people are served, when they're served, uh, what serves the high table, what comes down from high table, um, it is really quite interesting. There's a very early uh, text uh, of Arnus Magnus, uh, Daniel Beckles, uh, which is the book of the civilised man. So that, that's uh, quite a detailed discussion about things you should and shouldn't do. And, you know, if you did do the bone plinging, you'd have probably been kicked out of the medieval feast. <laughs> I was going to ask about table manners and taboos. So in 1530, guys, if you haven't read it, big recommend, Erasmus wrote a very famous book, which is full of information about how you should behave at the table and all sorts. Of, it's, it's wonderful, big recommend. It's uh, probably available on Gutenberg for free. Um, I always assumed that that was a very reactive book. <clears throat> So he looked at table manners and went, oh no, we shouldn't be doing this. Um, is that the case? Like, can you, can you share some specifics of table manners? Like what, what would come down from high table, for example, and for whom? Uh, so it'd be particularly choice meat. So, um, and we've noticed that in the, cause you, you have to, the different types of sources. So uh, one particularly good source is household rolls, where these are the rolls of account. Um, and the they, people. <laughs> they survived better for the later Middle Ages, but we have one or two in the 13th century. So we, we've been following the Bishop of Hereford, uh, Thomas Swinfield, um, and you can tell that they must, because it gives the list of his ingredients for Easter for Christmas, and some of these must only have been for high table because there's 70 people there and there's only six pigeons, and it's mm. one and pigeon isn't going to go very far. Like 70, so that presumably is for top table. And then, if you are particularly favoured by the Lord uh, of that feast, then you get, then you get, he will, he will send stuff down, down to you. So, fantastic, fantastic. Um, I mean, bad things to do. Daniel Beckles talks about it that you know, farting is not a good idea. Definitely. Yeah, there's, yeah. There's a there's another there's another great um, bit of um, feasting in that um, you would get someone to try your food because quite often, or oh, there was a there was a real concern that might be poisoned, so um, you you have a carver and you see you, um, in the imagery of medieval dining it's quite often a horseshoe, with people dining on the outside um, and on the um, on the on the inside you get the carvers and all the staff serving you the food and one of those uh would be someone to just check that the uh, wine that you've just been pour um, poured uh or the food isn't going to poison you so you just get well can you just try that first please to just check because i thought that was great now is this uh i'm assuming this isn't you've undercooked this chicken this chicken is so raw it's it's trying to fly <laughs> away is this poison i'm assuming this is more you know, edging into political intrigue and espionage and that kind of wonderful space. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. yeah. yeah. Were there so any that, infamous... You see, that's, that's a great thing to um, uh, introduce into our banquet. So we, we have these, um, the banquets at Blackfriars and, um, and we, we make sure that, the, that the, um, our guests know that they can ask the staff to try their food. Um, and their drink and of course our staff love doing that because um, they're being offered um, sips of wine glasses of wine. of course you can't do that in uh, in the covid world so i'm not too sure how we're going to uh, approach that post covid but um you know um you know the idea of staff being able to uh, sip some wine um they they love it and the customers love it 
Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. There was, there was a particularly unpleasant, uh, well, it depends whose side of the story you want, uh, but a Norman Abbey in the early 12th century where um, one of the local nobility was trying to trying to dominate it. And she, Isabella Venom, uh, ended up being given some poisoned apples. So, uh, <gasps> there is no white, I like it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. are there any are there any red weddings I've, I've thrown my questions to the wind now i want to know more about this red weddings are there any moments where people were you know whole banquets were poisoned or this kind of thing i'm referring of course to the red wedding in the game of thrones which was recently a series um any any sort of notable incidents like that or was that fantasy there were, there were certainly occasions where things go badly wrong, so uh, entertainment that went wrong. Uh, Edward II uh, had a series of dancers uh, who were in a costume, a uh, feathered costume, and they all caught fire and some of them died. And this is actually in, in a manuscript image, so it's like, no, that's not supposed to happen. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I can't, I can't think of mass poisonings the top of my head, but there are certainly I think, lots I think of things flaming, wrong. flaming <laughs> dancers, you've answered my question. I'm there, I'm there. So we've talked about table manners and rituals and traditions which are practical. Can you give us just a sousson of the symbolism and philosophy behind medieval food? Obviously the, the theory of the four humours, which I'd be very grateful if you would expand upon, um, was important. Is, you know, is, is that it? Is there other stuff? Like what's going on there? Uh, right, uh, on the humoral side, Sorry. no, it's a big one. So, <laughs> I mean, food and food and medicine are interesting because I mean they, they always go together in whatever society you're in. We have quite a medicalized um, approach because we know more about how the body works and nutrition. In the medieval sense, too, you can see. I mean, these sources that Andy was mentioning, uh, these were discovered by Faith Wallace, uh, friend of mine at McGill University, as she was on the trip. Um, they're originally from Durham, now in Sydney, Sussex, Cambridge, because the Archdeacon of Durham left them there in uh, 1602 or something. Anyway, they're, but they're very early. They're sources that look to us, that they sort of have a medical function in the sense that if you wanted to re-energise somebody's appetite, if they'd be very ill, um, this is the sort of thing you would do. These are tangy relishes that would make you make you eat stuff. So, in a sense, they advertise themselves as culinary, but there's a clear medicinal element, and they come in the middle of a medical recipe connection too. As you get later into the period, 13th century, you have these uh, regimen sanitatis, uh, you know, guides to, to how to, to live healthily. So that's much more medicalized food. Uh, so there's this constant balance between the two. Um, Humours come into that, so this is the fundamental ancient way of understanding how the body is regulated. So there are four elements in the world in which we live, earth, air, fire and water, and the humours in the body are related to those, so black and yellow bile, um, blood and phlegm. Elements, elements have different qualities and these are mimicked by these, so hot and cold or dry. Uh, or not, um, and wet, that's the one. Um, and, uh, <laughs> I think that's my favourite quote for today, hot, cold, or dry, or not. Or not, yes. Yeah, <laughs> I like it, I like it, it works. <laughs> and these work with the humans as well, but everybody is basically built of different combinations, so it's all scalar. Um, so each human is, is unique, and it's your humans going out of balance, your particular humans going out of balance, that causes distress or disease. Or, Right. Um, so this is why this is why when someone says, "Oh yes, he's very sanguine," that means yeah. he's very happy. But what yeah. it literally means is it's full of blood Absolutely because blood exactly. is the thing that made you happy, as it were. Right. So men are hot and dry, women are cold and wet in this yeah. system. Um, but then I mean, not fine. me, but yeah, everybody is <laughs> on everybody's on that scale. I mean, some some of the food works as a humoral diet. Some of it doesn't actually. Those sources from Poitou were humorally useless because uh, they would just balance everything out. So I think that's more about relish and flavour. Um, so the, the symbolism too, I mean, there's, uh, to bring it back to Easter, um, there's certain foods that are associated, not exclusively, I think there's very few foods that are exclusively associated with particular seasons, but for example, lamb does have a very strong um, connection, obviously through the Christian imagery, uh, to, the, to the Easter table. Um, Boar's head is associated with the Christmas season, so not necessarily the Christmas uh, 
Christmas Day dinner. Uh, that's also connected to the uh, timing of the hunting season for boars. Uh, so, so. Absolutely. Sorry, I guess ahead, egg, eggs is the other one. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, eggs with um, Easter. Yeah. yeah, not necessarily chocolate. No. Not necessarily chocolate. <laughs> not until later. <laughs> no. No. We have a lovely one of eggs the first, um, paying quite a sum of money for uh, quite a large number of eggs, I think 200 or so, to be decorated and painted for his children. Okay, interesting. Do yeah, we know anything cool. about the decoration or is it just decoration? It's just a, rec it's just a record in the very, very interesting. Yeah. Uh, in red, Greece, still red, undoubtedly. <laughs> I was going to say, in Greece to this day, you paint eggs red and you knock your boiled egg as somebody else's boiled egg. And if their egg dents, then you will have luck for the year and vice versa. So um, there's still there's, there's a lot of these things have persisted at least in some way in in various traditional traditional oh, cuisines and cultures. Absolutely, I think so. You know, fish is another good one that um, you know yeah. uh, Christianity doesn't regulate food in the same way that Judaism or Islam does, but it does regulate diet. So uh, 150 days of the year are fish days. Um, <laughs> there are other fast days where you eat relatively little, but fish days are important. You can't eat eggs. You can't eat meat. Um, and there's a lot, a lot of those in Lent, so, um, so hence um, Pancake Day. Yeah, absolutely. Straight, straight absolutely. Tuesday, that's the one. I'm doing well here. Uh, <laughs> You're fine. Really, You're fine. Having, <laughs> that's We're having eat, fun. That's all it's about. He's at one of the eggs. So that, um, that Bishop of Hereford's um, household robin shows that on Easter Day, his uh, 70 guests ate something like 4,000 eggs. <laughs> they were clearly going for it. <laughs> wow, that, that's a lot of pancakes is all I can say. A lot of pancakes, oh, no. a lot of pies, a lot of... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we've talked about symbolism and we've talked about rituals. Let's talk logistics, because this is one of the things, again, that I find really fascinating is you know when they were using exotic ingredients where were they coming from where what was the pipeline and and how were they getting there well um yes they, this you know they, this kind of leads on from charles's comments about the fact that um spices um uh, weren't used to cover up bad meat they would they were used because they liked them and they were relatively expensive um, and they had monetary value, of course, we know about peppercorn rent. Um, I think Giles's village um, rent was a pound of cumin a year, um, whether that was actually paid as cumin, that, 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 as that, only, mentioned. Yeah, that was any sort of last yeah. year. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, but, but the, um, yeah, they would have come from Eurasia, the, um, um, from, it, from Indonesia, uh, uh, through um, uh, the kind of steps, the character, you know, the, the, the traders would have brought them in from a variety of different routes, and their kind of relative potency would have been dependent on their packaging and how long they would have taken, um, and so on. But um, there is an inordinate amount of uh, saffron used in uh, particularly the recipes that we mm. are doing for Easter and uh, saffron has always, of course, been an incredibly expensive um, spice. Um, and so, um, you know, they, um, they, 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 you know, you'd like to think they used it sparingly, but I don't think they did. They used it like with great abandon, uh, but it must have cost, must have cost them an absolute arm and a leg. But um, mm. yeah, you're, you would show off um, your spice cabinet in the way that we might do um, these days. but. I, I've just been fascinated by the fact that um, their variety of spices and herbs seems to be greater than what we are used to uh, these days. So, um, you know, they had um, ale cost, customary, southernwood, dittany, hyssop um, were seem to be mentioned as, as regular herbs to be uh, used, which, of course, you don't really see around these days. Um, and similarly with spices. Um, then there's uh, references to references to long pepper, cubebs, grains of paradise, um, as well as all the regular spices that we see these days. So again, spices that we don't commonly see um, mm. these days. So we have to kind of source these, uh, you know, from across the world when we are 
trying to recreate authentic medieval recipes. Absolutely. So there's um, one of the things that uh, when I was sort of delving into 18th century foods, you know, sugar is, is still arriving in cones, you know. Mm. Um, so what, what kind of state were these things in when they arrived? Like, I'm assuming they must have been fresh enough to eat because people were eating them and they had taste buds then, just like they have taste buds now. But like, did they come full? Did they come ground? How, how, how were these <laughs> sort of approached, essentially? So I think a lot of the spices are in um, in their sort of granular form, so it'd be peppercorns or uh, cumin seeds, because there's a lot of instructions about makeup and powder. Um, and as Andy was saying, this is sort of there's different routes you can come from sea, uh, and it's chains of merchants. It's relatively unusual for people to go all the way out there. I mean, it happens, Marco Polo, if he ever went to China. Um, uh, but that's unusual. So there'd be chains of merchants that pass this on. And, that's affected by politics. Um, so the, uh, the Silk Road is opened up during the Mongol period uh, and then sort of closes down again. But it's the big entrepôts, Cairo in particular, um, and then Alexandria uh, as the port, uh, which then the Italian um, cities or Barcelona, those merchants then move these. And then there's a sequence of fairs. Um, by the 13th century, it's quite organised. You've got spice houses, spice guilds uh, in Newcastle, for example, and you'll find that everywhere. Bigger in bigger places of, of population, so London and Paris, you, you would be getting pretty much everything. So um, ground spices, whole, whole spices, and then, then ground up. They have kind of standard, well, I think everybody made their own version of this, but there's poudre four or poudre douce. A strong or a, a, a sweeter um, combination. So, and just he, to clarify for my audience, uh, that's uh, th these sort of spice mixes that they would make, yeah, and yeah. they were somewhat standardized. So, there was yeah. like a strong one and yeah. a sweet one, so but it strong, wasn't necessarily particularly sweet, right? No, so sort of the strong one is peppery, basically. Um, yeah. But it, you know, this is cinnamon, grains of paradise, not peppers, and you were saying, which is that lovely uh, Indian. In the India is actually quite important. It's a note important in this in this training. Um, we have had questions. So we, we have a recipe for ginger, uh, kind of conserved ginger, which is in that early collection. It's on the cusp. It could it's the last one of the culinary recipes, but it might be back into the medicinal collection. Uh, it's very, very similar to an aphrodisiac recipe um, of contemporary uh, ilk. So, <laughs> Interesting. Be careful when you make that one. Um, but but it calls for ginger that clearly you have to rehydrate. So okay, so it's 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 dried it's, essentially, yeah. Exactly. Well, what state it's in, whether it's semi-dried, uh, but you put it in water. Uh, if you do that with fresh ginger, as Andy did, <laughs> it ends up fairly disgusting after the number of days because it starts fermenting. Um, so we we presume this is a rehydration of some sort. And then with others, it's not it's not clear. So if there's a reference to coriander, is that the um, leaf or is that the um, the seed? The seed um, yeah. Quite a lot of that sort of uh, herb uh, uh, is a native to the Mediterranean. Um, so again, exactly how far things are coming is interesting. Yeah, and um, how much? How much were people trying to grow these things in the UK? There is a there is a legend. I don't know how true it is that the Romans were trying at least to grow. Uh, uh, crocuses in in Croydon, which is why it's called Croydon. That's where they were trying to grow saffron crocuses. Um, how how many of these herbs and spices did, we, did people try and grow locally? Um, but the, the herbs mostly would have been local. So I mean, again, as Andy was saying, it, it's herbs that we don't have in our palate now. Uh, southern wood is extremely bitter. Um, you might encounter that in the south of France as a way of keeping moths out of your wardrobe. Um, <laughs> Sounds delicious. <laughs> but cooked, it's amazing. Um, it, so they, they, they do different things. Um, saffron Morgan uh, in England is, a, of course, famous for its production of, of saffron. So, Yeah, um, absolutely. Wonderful. So um, it's, a, it's a strange society. It's intensely local and it's also international. Um, so it's very... Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Food either came from the field or India. Uh, I like that. And uh, sugar was also a spice in the medieval period. That's correct, right? Yeah, and also medicinal. So um, sugar is uh, prescribed. Uh, so actually quite a lot of 
uh, kind of classic 19th century or 20th century sweets have their origins as medieval medicine uh, metal medieval pills. Interesting. Can you give me some examples of that? Uh, things like, um, oh, let's see. Um, uh, oh, I'm asking for specific yeah, now, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, not pear drops. Um, Summer sherbet. That sort of that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay, so th those those kinds of sort of hard candies, that kind of yeah, that kind of space. Would it, Interesting. Um, um, yeah, no, actually, I think it's sort of sugar drops. Um, but we have so one of the infantas of Castile became so had so many of these prescribed that of course all the teeth dropped out. Um, but sugar's not really there until the 13th century. That's another oh, interesting thing. So uh, sort of come. I mean, the comes from Crete and then um, uh, well, basically across the Mediterranean uh, mm. into Sicily. So. And you watch recipe connections get sweeter as the as the centuries go on. That is very interesting. And since we are talking about preserving things and sugar and all that space, can you tell me a little bit about seasonal ingredients? So how would people how would people I saw one question came in, what what did people eat during the winter? Like how how did people preserve the food? How did they make sure that there was enough even when things weren't growing outside? In a, in a similar way to how we would do it these days. Um, in many ways, the, uh, the idea of um, brining, uh, smoking, salting, um, I was going to say had their, had their origins then, they probably had their origins far before that, but um, the, you know, the idea that you would um, figure out what you could um, keep through the winter through um, having it salted, so that, you know, salt cod is, is something that we're well aware of uh, these days and still is still a popular commodity um, and still used in um, certainly uh, um, from the Iberian Peninsula and so on. Say, but, um, Portuguese food, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, but, but, but um, yeah, I mean, you know, the idea that you would get your pig and um, you would figure out what you could, um, which bits you could salt on which bits, you know, the fatty bits you would salt, you would um, take the blood and make blood sausages and so on and um, and keep these as long as possible. But, you know, those, you know, with the advent and the probably recent, relatively recent popularity of um, allotments and things like that, and people trying to figure out, well, how, how do you keep potatoes or apples or, um, you know, vegetables for a period of time? And of course they were doing it. Um, you know, they, so, you know, I, I think that we're rediscovering techniques that um, uh, probably fell by the wayside, you know, 800 years ago. Um, one of them, actually, when we we're talking about bread earlier, the, you know, the idea of sourdough, um, where you leave a little bit of old dough in your um, bread making, um, you know, container, bowl of some sort. And, um, and that's the starter for the next day's bread. Um, I, you know, I don't know how far it goes back, but it was certainly a technique that was being used um, back in the uh, Middle Ages. And now we're discovering it as if it's something new, you know, sourdough bread, isn't it great? Well, of course it is great. <laughs> yeah, it is great, but there is nothing new. We're pretty sure of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. And it's so the same. Um, I was gonna, there's, um, you, we, we still, they, they still would have been, uh, suffered the kind of that, that hunger period um, where um, the climate, you know, the, the season would have been warming up. Um, to the point that their stored food would have started running out and going off. Um, yet mm. the stuff that they'd planted wasn't ready yet. And that, that hungry gap that we talk about these days was as relevant there then, um, particularly if the harvest was poor. So you had this kind of, that, that kind of early springtime um, issue with, well, what do we eat? Interesting. And I think that's a, that's a wonderful thing that you mentioned there, because the misconception is, oh, we'll be hungry at Christmas. But actually, no, you'll be hungry when the stores are out and the next stuff hasn't germinated. You don't have the crops ready yet. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. It, it's a society that, I mean, it's too bad harvest of mass starvation. So, yeah. Um, I mean, they did fish as well. And so fish can be wind dried or salt dried. And that's a huge part of the... Uh, European diet because of the insistence that it has to be eaten on, uh, of on fish days. So, and yeah. it's one of the engine rooms of the, of the medieval economy, really. Um, something that comes from the Baltic or the North Sea regions, or actually increasingly the Atlantic. We think the Portuguese and um, 
English sailors were on the Grand Banks by probably the 14th century. Wow, amazing. <laughs> so they were fishing far and wide. Like yeah. the, well, this wasn't just, you know, friendly waters. No, no. Very interesting. So what kind yeah. of fish then would they be eating from those locations? What, what are we talking about? So her herring is the absolute staple uh, cod as well. Um, and then there's the more kind of closer in estuary sort of fish. Um, and river fish uh, are preserved, are, are eaten um, and often farmed or kept in, in ponds. But those seem to be more the, the preserve of the aristocracy and the gentry. So the, the poorer you are, the more salt fish that you eat. Uh, Interesting. What again, about things uh, like, oh, sorry. Sorry, there's things like pike or trout or salmon. Um, they, these are yeah. more unusual. Um, right. And how about things like vinegar? Pike. Oh, gosh. <laughs> sorry, so sorry, please. Say, no, please I was going to say we, we see pike. I was going to say we, we, we see pike cropping up in um, medieval uh, recipes, which of yeah. course you don't really see these days. Yeah, absolutely. And how about things like um, vinegar preserving? Because that's something, of course, that's so common now. Um, is, that, is that something that they did? How, how did they manage that? I presume so. I mean, vinegar is um, widely used. Um, we've got references in our earliest right, connection. Um, different types as well. So verjuice is something that they're very fond of, which is uh, unripe grapes. Um, Okay, interesting. You can get it now. There are a few vineyards that are doing it um, in Australia in particular. Um, but it's a, it's a softer flavour to, mm. um, to vinegar. Um, Very cool. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, just before we hop to our um, audience questions, and holy moly, we have a lot. These guys have many questions for you, which is always a sign that they are super interested in what you guys have to say. Um, what kind of takeaway would you give to our world builders like if there's one thing that they should go into their their own world settings thinking whether that is a sci-fi world or a medieval fantasy world or in the 18th century what should they not forget about food like what is what is critical there i i i think um we we don't always think about what's going through their head when they eat in a formal setting. So we talked a little bit about um, the types of, you know, the types of banquets, the type of hospitality that might have been at Blackfriars. So Blackfriars, it's a Dominican friary um, and they, the Dominicans may have entertained um, some of the um, uh, local nobles. If uh, the King uh, um, Ed Edward the Edward the Third, in fact, um, Henry the Third and Edward the Third both came to visit Blackfriars on different occasions, and they probably kicked out the uh, friary cooks and brought their own, and they would have um, sent advance notice um, for um, what the the type of produce that they would have required um, in order to uh, feed the king and his retinue, but. Yeah, can you imagine that if you are you you are entering into the um, uh, the the dining hall and either the king is there or um, someone of great importance and you've got to behave in a particular way? It's a bit like imagine going for a banquet with the queen and you are really not too sure about what the etiquette is and mm. and that thought process and how nervous people may have been. Um, if it was their first time, um, do, you know, about getting it right, um, about, you know, it's not just using the right knife and fork. Um, there was a lot of, you know, you, you, you as Giles said, you would have been kicked out if you behaved incorrectly. And I think that, you know, it, it, nowadays, you know, if we're serving people, a large group of people, then we serve them in the kind of Russian style of cookery where uh, of, of of banqueting where everyone has the same um course um, but one course after another and that's where we typically see in great houses the um huge um sets of knives and forks kind of starting here mm -hmm. and, and slowly uh coming in and people um whereas it wasn't like that you know the, the king the, the the high table got the spoils and then depending on where you were it was all kind of brought down to you it's, it's quite a complex type of cook uh, type of um, uh, 
uh, arrangement and such that I can imagine there were almost as many or sometimes more staff uh, preparing and serving the food than there were diners there. Um, and yeah. getting that, getting all of that right, and you can just imagine the kind of personal relationships and the thought processes and the confidence or the nerves that people were having about that process must have been just just huge yeah. yeah i think i think it's a sense of scale that's really important to get especially for great households and great events um so the marriage of henry the third's uh, daughters of the king of scotland it's four thousand years um they were not all of them kind of being fresh. Some of them must have been preserved, but you're talking about a feast on a scale which is just enormous. Um, noble households are spending 20% of their considerable incomes on food and entertainment. So this is a vast expense because it's such an important part of lordship. It's such an important part of showing uh, that, you know, you are generous, you, you, you do have all of your spices, you have got the latest uh, cookbook from France that so you are keeping up with the Valois. Um, which, which I think is another important element that mimicking and, and imitating uh, the houses and, and, and making sure that you do have the, the most recent uh, recipes. So I think that sense of scale, also the homogeneity, what we've, we've been branching into the French traditions and the Catalan traditions. And of course there were differences, but what's extraordinary is the similarities. Interesting. Really, really interesting. Guys, that is awesome. And I, I'm sure that our well builders are sitting there thinking, oh my God, this is, this is great, like the, the keeping up with the neighbors, the conspicuous consumption, and also that sort of very personal approach, which I think you're absolutely right. It's so easy to look into the past and forget that these are flesh and blood people who have flesh and blood emotions about everything that is going on. Yeah. Um, all right, let's jump to some audience questions. There are some great ones here. Uh, G Zephyr, kicking off with a winger. Yorkshire pudding, is it medieval? <laughs> um, well, in the sense that putting eggs and flour together with some fat, um, you can find that fairly uh, standardly across uh, medieval recipes. I think probably in its designation as a Yorkshire pudding, it's, it's a bit late. Yeah. Would be my guess. Yes, in fact, there's a, there's a lot of discussion about whether the Yorkshire pudding is actually from Yorkshire, but uh, I'm not going to touch that with a birch pole because because <laughs> wow, people get people get very uh, very possessive about this kind of thing. Um, actually, I remember it was used to, um, and the Yorkshire pudding was, of course, used was always served or was traditionally served at the beginning of the meal, and it's there to to fill you up, isn't it? You know, that's that's the um, and so you know it was probably used in a. In you know somewhere where you where you tended to get a lot of um, people were expending a lot of energy and required a um, a lot of calories and therefore fill them up with the Yorkshire pudding before we give them the meat. Yeah, absolutely. In the same way that in Italy you eat your pasta before you eat your main course because <laughs> then you get full and your main course is it's just. Um, RPG Dinosaur Bob asks, when we're talking medieval specifically in the context of this talk, what kind of period are we talking about? Um, well, you can, I mean, I play this game with my students, what is the Middle Ages. Um, but in terms of this one, we can be reasonably precise at the beginning because we don't have recipe collections um, between the end of the Roman Empire, so Epicius, and then about 1170, which is our first culinary collection. They start getting more common from the middle of the 13th century and then the full flourishing and glory is the 14th and 15th century collections. And I would take it up to about the 16th century, um, first half of, um, would be it's similar techniques. Um, and things don't start to really shift until the, until the 17th century. Um, on that score, in terms of what people were eating, um, I tend to use the, the more traditional late antiquity is sort of 350 to 700, um, which is the kind of beginning of the early Middle Ages. From a more northern European perspective, it's of course different if you're in the Mediterranean, it's different if you're in different cultures. So having said that sugar really enters Western Europe in the 13th century, it's being used in Islamic countries in the 10th and 11th century. So Egypt is a huge producer of sugar cane 
I don't think it's an important bit. Sugar cane, not sugar beet. Beet, beet isn't a medieval phenomenon. So that came from the Americas, right? So that wasn't until much. It was um, Eastern Europe starts, oh, uh, but it's a 17th century and early 18th century phenomenon that you extract sugar from the. Um, Very cool. Sugar. All right. Well, there we go. How would you say that 13th century food is different from modern food in a nutshell? Asks Stiltis. <laughs> like the kind of the kind of flavours we'd be experiencing. It is well. We were doing this, so we were we were doing the preparation and filming days for the the show, and there's we were trying a, a dish called Daniels, which is a sweet dish, but it's got this. It's the first medieval food I ever tasted, actually, and that it's got this very strange, sweet and sour, astringent, um, but also delicate qualities going on. So it. It's kind of what you're expecting, and then it does something very interesting. But it's it's the extremes of flavour, I think. Yeah, I don't know if that would be yeah. what you think. Of. Yeah, and the way way that they um, yeah mix, mixed um, sweet and savoury uh, together, um, use a lot of fruit in um, mm -hmm. cooking. Um, yeah. The the um, yeah the, the the amount of I mean you know you you think about kind of spiced wine. The mold wine types of things and the and the mm. amount of flavor that went into goes into those is um mm. is incredible um we've um yeah we've put we've put stuff together which has got kind of cinnamon clove nutmeg uh mace and then it goes on to uh fennel, fennel seeds caraway seeds then oh let's put some um spike nard or some rosemary in it and and actually it's just really interesting um you taste these things and and we've all tasted stuff and said we've never tasted anything like that before. Yeah, I think uh, whenever I've read through medieval uh, recipes, it's it's always been the number of spices mm -hmm. and the amount of things that are sweet but meat or like meat with fruit or yeah. or like why is yeah. there why is there so much sugar? Again, these these are the later recipes, but um, yeah, yeah, it's it's always always surprised me as well. Like it's yeah. it's it's just a very different palate, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, tang tangy, tangy, vinegary, sharp and acidic sauces on the one hand, but as you say, this is sort of very, very sugary dishes. They will cook with cream, uh, tends to be in the later, later yeah. connections. Um, I saw a lot of almond milk in mm. uh, recipes, a lot of almond milk. That shocked me. It's standard. So again, they, they don't not cook with milk, but it does tend to be a bit later. But of course, unpasteurized milk is quite difficult Iffy. to use. Uh, yeah. Almond milk is brilliant because you can control the consistency and it keeps for longer. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, is is milk one of the things that can't be eaten on uh, fish days or you can have milk? You can't have eggs, but you can have milk. Do you know? I don't. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Sitting there asking well, all the wrong uh, questions, guys. Presume, presume yeah. not. No, I don't think. Uh, no, I'm going to note that down for what's happening. There we go. It's yeah. excellent. Put it to me <laughs> to be difficult. Um, what's the best medieval dessert that you've discovered? Asks Lady Grayish. What do you recommend, guys? What's on the menu? Your favourite, Andy? Uh, well, we've just made uh, the Dario that you were talking about earlier. Um, yes. is um, is a bit like what we would call a Manchester tart. It's um, that that's not a euphemism, by the way. Um, I was wondering. But, <laughs> but straw, strawberries and dates on the base of a custard tart, and it's uh, and it's fun. It's fantastic. But I I think I know which one Charles is going to say because he always likes uh, the name of this particular dessert. Oh, sure. tell us. Or Cuscano. No, creme bastard. Oh, creme bastard. Yeah, I like that one too. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah, creme All right, bastard. so not only can you have a bastard sword, you can also have creme bastard. I love but, that. So bastard just means that you've, it, it, that means adulterated cream. So in, in, and it has a particular sense uh, of, um, in the culinary sense of that, adding things to it. So it, it comes out as a sort of uh, strange cream drink dish thing with it, but it's really selling it it's delicious <laughs> strange cream drink dish thing but it's, it's, yeah, it's, but it's, it's delicious yeah it's a, it's a strange consistency is it it's, like, it's okay. not quite not quite set like a custard tart i mean it's a kind of custard pudding but um, yeah yeah, yeah. 
rice pudding Mag- in the medieval period because it's it's a, they're, they're yeah, crazy yeah. about it in the 18th century i can tell you that it's rice pudding everything <laughs> yeah to do rice um we tried actually a couple from the uh, 13th century connections so pinet which is a lovely nut uh nut dessert um and tarpaulin again lots of figs and dates um yeah is, yeah eggs yeah yeah, yeah. interesting yeah. In, in fact, um, actually, probably in terms of a sweet thing, um, my favourite, my current favourite, is the egg that's not really an egg. Oh, that one. Now, yeah. now the egg that, of lies. Um, Tell us about the egg of lies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, you. Um, I'm not sure how much I'm allowed to say about it, but I'll tell you what. It's um, it is absolutely delicious. Is this, and it is doesn't this a teaser have, for your course, by the way? It might well, possibly it's, be. It yeah. Might be yeah. <laughs> it's an egg that doesn't have any egg in it. Um, but you can kind of, there's, there's a uh, famous chocolate um, company uh, that makes an egg that probably doesn't have any egg in it, um, that we will, get, um, we will get them all year round these days. Um, and, um, and we wonder whether it was the, one of the uh, kind of precursors to that. Interesting. Those of you who've gone from the UK will probably know what they are hinting at. Um, my favourite medieval dessert is not a medieval dessert at all. It is the honeyed wine of Apicius, which I'm pretty sure they still made honey wine later. Um, we had many parties when I was a student on that honeyed wine. It was You can take really bad wine and make really good wine with the honeyed wine from Apicius recipe. Just say it. That is true, and we have been we have been looking at the different ways that you can treat wine. So, um, mm. yeah, big old recommend yeah. on that one. Yeah. Um, I do still have the recipe somewhere if anybody would like it. Um, are there any recipes that you found where you've thought this cannot work, but it's actually turned out amazing? Ask Stillers. Um. There are some where you look at them. I mean, there's the stage that we they go through with quite a few where you take it to the chefs and say, uh, can this work? And they look at you and go, not quite sure. Um, there are ones where uh, there was a ball recipe where it wasn't entirely clear what was supposed to be happening. Um, then the more elliptical they get, the more room for maneuver you have for interpretation, but it's not. There's a one from a French collection called Menagier on partridge in an orange sauce, but it, with a tiny bit of rose water, but it's really not clear what you're supposed to do, whether this is supposed to be some kind of soup or whether it's a different thing. Yeah. Like, like all these things, it's about balancing them and balancing the flavors. So if you, yeah, you won't get any, any quantities at all in these things. Um, well, one of the ones that I just found amazing is sauce madame, which um, nice. uh, which is basically putting um, you cook quinces, and if you've ever cooked with quinces uh, quince before, um, then you have to boil them for ages and ages because they're solid as a rock before, um, and then you put them with a whole pile of herbs and grapes and stuff into the cavity of a goose. Oh, um, nice! Yeah, and it's so it's so good. You think. Why, why don't we do this these days? Mm-hmm. You don't see sauce manette, but it could, it's, it could be a perfectly good modern um, dish that people should yeah. make every Sunday type thing. Yeah. Okay, um, so, yeah. I did uh, a Christmas chicken. It was amazing. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. I think the first time I read, take, take your fish and put it in a coffin, was the first time I went, <laughs> what? Could you tell us a little bit more about coffins? Oh, yeah. I don't know if you have them in the medieval period. Uh, I know they have them in 18th century uh, oh, cuisine. No. Yeah, no, it's, pastry ca- it's just pastry cases. So. Right, so they call pastry cases coffins. So the yeah. recipes are absolutely full of put it in a coffin and then do this. And you're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. That's true. Didn't, didn't translate well. We have an excellent question here from Drakan. Are there any dishes um, that you guys have come across uh, which would today be considered to use a dangerous or inedible ingredients? Uh, yeah. Tell um, me, tell me more. Um, so there is a recipe that we were looking at. So our 12th century connection is uh, the main one we were looking at, but you can, there are other sorts of singleton recipes from, from the same period. Uh, one of them from a chap called Henry of Huntington, which uses for pork and it uses pennyroyal 
which is an abortive vacuum intervention really uh, and occasionally has been known to kill people so that was one where it was you know, don't, don't use penny oil yeah don't don't eat penny roll guys don't try this at home <laughs> Any, uh, anything there's, to there's, add anymore? Yeah, there's, there's others where it's rarer, so costus, uh, the, the, um, the rhizome, but it's actually quite innate. It's you know, quite difficult to get hold of. Um, so, and quite rare, so we don't use that. Um, so, um, and then other ones, there's sort of substitutions. Um, so, uh, when we're making uh, uh, the Hippocrats, that lovely spiced wine, we tend to use. Uh, rosemary um, because it's a valerian um. interesting very cool andy anything I'm just to add gonna to that? say there's well there's some things that you just need to be pretty careful about like um plunging a red hot poker uh into into some old wine uh to warm it up um because they didn't have any microwaves at the time now that's something that you would do these days but you have to be uh, very very careful <laughs> not to kill yourself doing it Right. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Uh, no, yeah. no health and safety in medieval kitchens. I'm assuming. I mean, the other thing that we so the other thing is that we don't do. We're not doing reenactment cooking, so we're not cooking over over wood, which is its own perfect skill. And there are lots of places that do that incredibly well, and lots of people that explain that. Um, so this is restaurant cooking rather than um, other than spit roasting or other yeah. instructions. So. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, a question here about smoke houses. Were they a household thing? Um, obviously, there weren't fridges, so preservation was really important. Uh, what kind of things were like cottage industry and what kind of things did you have to take it to somebody else to do? That's a very good question. Um, it, it depends. So if you're a big, massive noble great household then most of that will be in-house so if you're the Dukes of Northumbria um you'll be I mean they make a lot of they make all their own ale um they will so most of most of their produce will be will be in-house if you're not quite that scale or if you're urban um so not many places have kitchens in town for obvious reasons so you know you share out the bread making and bakery that sort of thing. Smokehouses, I imagine, will come into that category as well. Um, Wonderful. Very we, interesting. We would, uh, we would assume that everyone, uh, even the peasants, would have access to firewood and would have, mm. you know, a um, at the very least some kind of um, shelter house with a fire in the middle of it. So they would and should be able to smoke uh, things. But um, you, yeah, you mentioned ale, Giles. Um, ale was produced by ale wives uh, for a long period. It was very much a female um, type okay. of activity. Uh, <laughs> until, for, for... until it became industrial and profitable, and then the men took over. Sorry, yes. about, that. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry about Sorry about it. Sorry about it. And and with bread making, of course, then. Um, only certain people are allowed to grind the um, corn. Um, and um, you know, if you're found to be grinding the corn when you weren't allowed, then you were punished severely. So, um, so and, and because if you, um, if you were producing um, uh, corn wheat for, um, and, and having it ground, you would always have to give up a proportion of it to um, your Lord. Yeah, so it was a, a tithe tax essentially on on whatever you were yeah. you were taking essentially. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Which is slightly separate from the ovens that would actually bake it. Right. So how did it work with the ovens? So you you've grown your own grains. Yeah. You take them to be ground. Yeah. They take a bit. Yeah. And yes. then you make your bread. Yeah. And then yeah. you take it to the oven. Yeah. Which yeah. is presumably belonging to somebody else because really? ovens are Kind yes. of a pain to have one of your own, right? And a fire risk. Um, right, exactly. Yeah. And then, do you pay? Is there a thirteenth loaf that goes to the to the baker? Is that how that works? I'm not sure how the exact arrangements work, but yeah, it's a common um, facility normally. Um, so. I think because there wasn't a tax associated with it, it was yes, it was, it was more communal rather than the, the, the you know, um, grinding grain was a very specific activity um, that only certain people do. So that was related to 
yeah, the, the, the money side of it, whereas yeah. baking wasn't quite so much. But, um, and you, you know, the, and, sorry. yeah, because because stuff was um, because stuff was baked communally, then it kind of gave gave rise, I think, to um, the, you know, the street food that we again, what we would consider to be quite a modern uh, invention in, in a way, you know, people were, you yeah. know, baking stuff and selling it on the street um, yeah, 800 so. years ago. Exactly. So bread deliveries, that's an urban phenomenon. I mean, most people live in the countryside or in the Middle Ages, but um, but in the towns, it's, uh, yeah, the delivery. You can't eat milk, you can't drink milk in then. But... Interesting. So I you talked a little bit... Out. Sorry. I did find out you can't drink milk in then. <laughs> so we talked a little bit about um, how how ale was was more the domain of women than men. Are there are there other things? So, for, for example, the professional kitchen rather than your your own personal kitchen was was there a gender divide there? Yeah, master chefs and generally men. Um, so Interesting. Baking, Interesting. Could, I think baking can be more or less either. Um, and again, as Andy said, up to the middle of the fourteenth century. Um, be, uh, ale making is fairly decentralised but dominated by women uh, and it's after it becomes a more centralised guild process um, particularly in London um, that it becomes dominated by men. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I do have a question for you that nobody has asked and I'm shocked that they have not asked it yet. What about medieval taverns? So you probably aren't familiar with Dungeons and Dragons, um, but in Dungeons and Dragons, I am old. sorry, I'm old enough for Dungeons and Dragons. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so in Dungeons and Dragons, the archetypical beginning is you you start in a tavern, right? What were taverns? What did they serve? What were they responsible for? What did they feel like? Were they different in towns as opposed to cities? Tell me everything. Uh, there were great great stories about taverns. Um, and yeah, so they go back an awfully long way. These are inns for pilgrims to stay, for wayfarers to stay. Um, actually, kings often do that. So King Knight Richard II, who I'm reading about at the moment, uh, when Richard is particularly itinerant in areas where there aren't that many big houses to stay in, and he quite often ends up staying in a local inn, um, which must have been quite a consternation to the innkeeper. Um, right, because so, he comes with a household as well, right? Well, the household would probably be dispersed elsewhere in the in the town or the settlement, uh, or wherever they could find lodgings. Um, and you have, I mean, they serve wine, beer, um, ale. Um, there's a lovely case at the Swindle Stock Tavern in uh, Oxford, uh, the site of site of which is there. It lasted until the 18th century, so it's right in the centre of Oxford at Carfax, where the St. Scholasticus Day riots started there in the 14th century because uh, one of the students at the Swindle Stock spat the wine back at the publican uh, with, with bad comments about how dreadful this wine was and then three days of, riot, three days of rioting and about 100 people killed with the result of that. So, Holy moly! Yeah. Okay, that, that goes in the bad table manners category. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, um, <clears throat> in swear <clears throat> every bit as much as, as they come across in Chaucer. So, pretty yeah. rough, pretty rough places. So. Yeah, and there was probably some truth in the um, bad wine because you know they didn't have any of the preserving techniques, or I didn't I didn't have that much knowledge about how um, to um, to keep things things good so the um so beer was a was a pretty easy thing because it would have been made by the ale that by the wife in the back room on site um and used as quickly as as you know as soon as it was made fresh beer would have been uh, been drunk um wine would have been slightly harder because um you know the the grape half you know, it's dependent on the grape harvest so um you know when my, when wine is made then uh, they're going to have um uh, quite a difficulty in making sure that it's kept yeah. fresh yeah, um, so before it's before it's drunk. So, so um, but no, I, I John, there's no vintages in uh, medical wine. Really. Yeah, but I, you know, I love the uh, tradition of hospitality in the medieval period. Uh, there was um, this great sense that if someone turns up, well, particularly if you turned up in a monastery or a friary, then you had a um, 
the the, uh, the, the friars and monks had a responsibility to take care of people, um, and um, but I think that that kind of um, really spread um, not not just through the religious houses but beyond that. So if you turned up at a uh, at a tavern and you wanted to stay the night, you were you were bedded down on the rush on the rushes there. There wasn't bedrooms. There weren't bedrooms, of course. Um, you, you bedded down in the rush amongst the rushes amongst the uh, mice and the rats. Uh, and whatever, and that's where you that's where you slept for the night. Um, but you could all you know you could generally turn up and get a bed, or get a night you know stay the night, and they would have something to eat and so on. So this fantastic sense of hospitality um, in the in the period, and I guess because when people are travelling, they were travelling what felt like relatively longer distances, and when they got there, they had to be taken care of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Fascinating. Guys, you have been a mine of glorious information. Thank you so much. Just before uh, we talk more about Eat Medieval, because I cannot wait to ask more about it, I want to remind everyone that there is a raffle going on for a place at the course Eat Medieval, where you can learn more about Giles what? <laughs> so this is our course for Easter. Uh, which we call Fast and Feast, uh, Taste of Easter Fast. So uh, it kicks off on Monday, the 22nd of March, lasts until Friday. Um, <clears throat> you get a series of different um, films and information. So there are at least three recipes uh, every day. Um, we've basically worked through from the Monday to the Fridays, so from more Lenten dishes to more Eastery dishes. So we are quite fish heavy on the first two and a half days or so. And then we move to a fantastic recipe for roast lamb uh, on the Friday. Um, so those, those are pre-recorded films uh, by our wonderful filmmaker, Alan Fenterman, who's the third part of our partnership. Um, uh, Newcastle-based uh, filmmaker, um, and they're all uh, Craig uh, Nicholson, who's the cookery chef at Blackfriars. We have one day on the Monday, which is live, so um, we do live events there, which is so, again mostly Craig. Yeah, tell me more about these live events. What can what can people expect? Like, what is the participation like? What will they be learning? So we'll so Andy and I will introduce, and then we disappear and answer questions, uh, whilst Craig live demonstrates the recipes. That we're going to be doing so that might or might not feature eggs that are not eggs um, secret eggs of lies so then we have so then we have these pre-recorded uh, films we have a set of uh, things which we call learn medieval which are short academic films from me and my colleagues on the academic side and um, to uh, podcasts as well or podcast episodes uh, we then have live zooms uh, every day um, slightly alternated between 9 a.m. and 7.30 p.m. UK time because we have some Aust Australian um, participants, uh, but we figure between the two we can just about cover everybody. Um, so you get all of this, it's quite a lot to get through the week, so that's at least 15 or 16 recipes um, to take away and work through. They are primarily uh, from the English connections, but they range from the 13th to the 15th centuries. But we've also introduced recipes from the Catalan uh, traditions of the uh, 14th century and the French Menagerie cookbook, uh, which is about 1390. So um, we keep the course, so you get, if you register for the course, um, then you order, you can access it through the medieval.com website. You have to go to the Blackfriars restaurant page link to actually sign up. Uh, and that's where you enter your discount code um, if you have one. Um, Which everybody listening does. Yes, these lovely, lovely beans have given us 20% discount off the course. That's if you don't win the raffle, which I think the beans behind the scenes are just about to draw. And uh, the code is Sinzibert. Sinzibert? Sinzibert, yeah. yeah. Is that how I'm pronouncing it? Uh, I, for some reason, I want to pronounce it with a German accent. I'm not sure why. Zinzibert <laughs> Durham. Is that correct? Z I N Z I N Z I B E R D U R H. So, what is Zinzibert? What is ginger. it? Uh, ginger in old French. Ah, there so we go. Zinzibert, really. <laughs> ah, there we go. Perfect. <laughs> So we have all of those, um, and but what we do is we'll, we'll give you two codes. The first code gets you access to your ingredient list, the things you should buy, and uh, Andy will give you some advice about uh, shopping, and I'll give there's a little bit of information about the 
had the kind of the connections. And then the second home comes on the morning before the, the course opens. Um, now we keep the main course open for about three weeks afterwards because there's more than enough um, to fill basically a month of cooking. And obviously we understand that not everybody can take a week off to cook medieval food. Um, much so I'm sure everybody would like to. <laughs> <laughs> I know that I would. Guys, thank you so very much for joining us today. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. You have been a mine of wonderful information. And I do hope that you will come back and talk to us again, maybe. Love you. to, absolutely love to. Wonderful. Yeah. And thank you very much for having us. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Yeah. Oh, I don't know about that, but I am always, always <laughs> happy to talk world building and food and crazy historical things. That is my jam. Uh, can you give us a little, a little sneak? You can say no, you can say no. A little sneak about what might be coming after the Easter course. Like what can well, people look forward to? <laughs> So we've planned, uh, we're going to have an exploration of, of the main English uh, connection, which is a uh, form of QE, which was the Royal Connection for Richard II. Um, but we have in Durham one of the principal manuscripts of that. So it's, it's a kind of compilation of things, but form of QE is the main connection, uh, about 100, uh, over 100 recipes. And, and they're so, so weird and wonderful, can yeah. I just say. They, like, this is, this is a premium collection. So if I'm correct, this is the collection that belonged to uh, Richard II's professional kitchen. That right. he would then, they would go around with Richard II and boot anybody out of the kitchen because this is what Richard II wanted to eat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Or, or maybe it's what his guests wanted to eat. It was a, um, in a sense, it was an aid memoir uh, for, for him <laughs> and his cooks if, if, someone, if someone of particular notoriety arrived. Um, or they wanted to cook, but yeah, it's it's the book that um, is often noted as like the the first recipe book um, in in England, and that's how that's how um, it's often viewed. And I remember Giles telling me about it, and I, I and um, and I you know I'm getting used to the period at the time, and and he said it wasn't printed, it wasn't printing presses, it was it was of course handwritten uh, at the time, and then. You know this 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 book. If someone wanted a copy of it, then they had to get someone a scribe to um, copy it out. Oh, yeah. And when they copied it out, then it wasn't exact. They would have made a mistake, and so on. And um, but we have one of the original uh, books. And I, I said, well, you know, where would I find one of these books? He says, oh, I, I happen to have one. Would you like to see it? <laughs> it's like yes. <laughs> okay, I shouldn't be asking yeah. any more questions, but I've seen my cookery books. Uh, was was this a cookery book in the back to reference, or was this a cookery book with saffron spilled all over it? Like, what what state is the manuscript in? Uh, manuscript is pretty good. I mean, it's actually um, bounded by med medicinal recipes. Um, oh, okay, interesting. So still, there's that um, uh, connection with medicine. <laughs> um, there's three um, of them running around here, and they think it's <laughs> dinner time too. Excellent. Um, okay, so, I, but it's it's I, clearly it's clearly not being used in the kitchen. So that's no, a very absolutely. interesting thing about who actually uses these recipe places. Anyway, that will be coming in the. That'll, that, that'll be coming, but you know the the the, 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 the takeaway for this is that it's um, these courses are for both the, uh, enthusiasts, uh, amateur enthusiasts like myself, they're for academics like Giles. The idea is that we give you an insight into medieval food um, with a particular angle and the angle that's coming up is uh, Easter. You will get to see and hear some things that you're probably unlikely to read anywhere else in any other um, uh, book uh, because Giles manages to, and his academic team um, unearth stuff that you just wouldn't know. And that's the beauty of them is that we take, we're, we're taking people kind of on a journey and you can get into it as much as you want. Uh, you can just cook the stuff or you can learn about the period or whatever, but it's, a, um, it's an exploration of medieval food and all of its guises in a unique yeah. way. Just a bit, a little bit Greek for Easter, we've got eggplants and lamb. So. <laughs> See, I want to be there now. I want to be there. Um, yeah, I, I, would, I would just add that um, it's, uh, it's, it's possible to read the form of Curie on, on Gutenberg. I think it, it is there. Uh, it's wonderful. It's very hard to understand. And it's specialists like Giles and Andy who really take it from what the actual to 
wow okay i understand how this how this looks in the real world how this feels and tastes and smells and and you know they they bring it from questions on a page to something that is that's mm -hmm. real and vibrant i have been asked to ask if darth nicholas is in the house because they have won a seat at your wonderful table darth <clears throat> nicholas please say something to claim your prize or we will have to re draw the raffle. In the meantime, I must thank a lot of people here. Um, I'd like to thank Gilly Meyer for gifting a sub. I would like to thank, um, oh wow, a lot of follows. And for the hosts, Zura Dev, Extremcy and Laura Bones. Thank you all very much for your support today. Um, congratulations, Darth Nicholas, who is in fact in the house and will be joining you in March for a uh, medieval <laughs> cookathon for the ages from the sounds of it. Holy moly. Uh, guys, thank you so much for taking your time to come talk to us. I realized that, you know, I could talk about medieval food all day and I almost have. Could, so thank you so too. much. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks, Jenny. Um, thank folks, you, Jenny. I cannot recommend yeah. enough Eat Medieval. So uh, do make sure you go and check them out. But in the meantime, grab your hammer and go well built. <laughs>